Great. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I hate formal invitations, which is why I write, usually try to write very, very short bios that solves the problem. Um, although Google's made that slightly trickier. I mean, first of all, my, my, my thanks to the, to the Maltese Government, Department of Education and Alex um, for the invitation to come here for my first time to Malta, which I've, I've enjoyed enormously, and to, to Sue Falzon and her team who've made it really, really easy um, to do that. So, so thanks very much. I, I'm talking to you from the context of, of, of two things. I'm a schizophrenic person. Well, actually, I, I, there's, there's maybe a word for a three-part split brain. I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, I spent decades as a, as a university professor, and I spent the last decade as a suit, as a vice president as a member of my university um, senior management team. Um, and, and I find that so my perspective on, on the world is... is is governed by those two things, the sort of the, the free and the, and the individualist and the sometimes wild and cowboy. And I, I have to say I've never used creative commons in anything I've done because I've stolen liberally from everywhere. And I assume everybody steals liberally from me, so I've never really worried about it. But, but I'll go back and correct them later, Cable. Um, uh, but the third part of my brain is that I recently retired and so now I look back on it and I think, well, what does all that mean? So I'm going to talk about traditional higher education. My interest really is about scale. How do you do things big? Because although there are lots of small scale things that go on, the question is how much impact do you get from that? And Cable's talked talk very clearly about the impact of, of open educational materials and resources. And I'm going to concentrate more on courses and and. and um, and curricula and structures. Um, some of what I, all I talk, talk about higher education, some of what I'll talk about is actually directly relevant to vocational training. Indeed, I'll, I'll blur into that. I think schools are more problematic as an area to deal with, and I tend to stay away from them when I'm talking about them because my, um, my view of school education, having had, had kids gone through school and come out the other end and got grandchildren coming in, I feel is too jaundiced to talk about in public. Okay, now, how do I move on? Push the green button. Green. Shows how untech I am. Okay, so, I mean, I think that the critical thing that one has to start with, I mean, open education, in a sense, is, is, is of no value unless you know where it is that you want to go, where it's taking you. All of the things that we talk about here have got to be taking you in a direction that you wish to go in. And if you analyse policy statements, and, and I think if you unpick the term, the Weasley word, student-centred, which have got lots of meanings to, to different people, and everybody I know says that their education is student-centred, um, it, it seems to me that there's a whole set of facets about, about which some people will agree and some pe people won't agree, but for me... Without that range of options available to learners, we have not achieved student-centeredness. It's not that all learners will want those. Many students may still want a, a, a fixed location, timetabled experience. But in a world of lifelong learning, when people will go in and out of higher education and maybe not do degrees the way they do them now, we need to be able to offer a wider range of ways of doing higher education than we do at the present time. And so for some people, on demand, I need to do it now. We had a discussion actually before the conference started about people signing up for things at Christmas because it's a peak time when people sign up for stuff. Um, and we've certainly um, had lots of reference um, to career relevance um, and personalised personalization. And so it seems to me that, that these are the sorts of attributes that to varying degrees we need to try to achieve and across a wide range of subjects. Higher education covers a massive range of subjects. And so clearly to achieve that is an enormous ask. And the question that I'm going to pose is can at least one of the forms of higher education, uh, open higher education, begin to address those sorts, of, um, those sorts of questions? And I'll come back to that at the end. Open education as a term, means, means different things to different people, and, and, and I sometimes annoy people by, by not having the same definition that, that they have. We've got a defini definition here, which comes from the European Commission. Um, some people focus on the, open, the materials part of it, the licensing part. Some people focus on portability and the ease of moving things, of moving credits. And some people focus on the um, sort of boundaryless institutions and the freedom to build and personalise cri your, your criteria. 
there's, there's a rather useful set of documents which came out of the, um, after the European Joint Research Centre um, unit in, in Siberia. I think that Andrea is here and, and maybe she will speak to this this afternoon. So if you're interested in policy framework about how higher education as organisations might take themselves into a more um, open education world, then that is a useful read. Because I'm an awkward academic and I always think that I am right, I have my own facets of what openness means. So these are my, my sort of plain English facets of what, what I think openness is. At. It may actually be about, in other words, some or all of these things. Open regardless of prior qualifications. Actually, open universities, which is where I began my academic life and that marked me for life, the idea that you took in students um, from everywhere uh, regardless. Prior qualifications. No matter where you studied before or actually where you want to take your courses from, um, open regardless of your ability to pay. To me, importantly, open regardless of start time, pace, place, amount of study or sequence of study. In other words, the way that we do higher education at the present time with these rather lockstep sequences and, 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 and tight structures um, that require you to be in places, those would break. Actually the ability to study with a brown paper bag over your head so that nobody knows who you are. The right, in a sense, to a privacy uh, is important to some people. Um, some would argue that it wouldn't be open if you weren't use openly licensed OER-type materials, um, etc. Um, so there are different facets that one might look at in terms of the ways that higher education might go open. Um, and, and, and so I've decided that what I would do is I would contrast what I see as perhaps the two extremes at the present time in terms of the higher education provision that's offered by traditional European, I'm going to talk mostly about European, traditional European universities, the first cycle degree, which tends to be the least open um, of, of offerings in general across Europe, versus the MOOCs, the massive open online courses, um, and, which are probably at this point in time, the largest movement in terms of scale and impact of traditional higher education institutions into open education in general. Now, I know that some people would argue about whether MOOCs were open, and that's partly why I decided to do this analysis. They have degrees of openness, um, as open universities do, um, and they have significant degrees of closeness, and I think that, 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 that that Cable would probably point to, um, the very low use. In fact, it was almost his first question to me was about, do your MOOCs produce OER? You know, are your materials open? Um, so there's a closeness about them too. But they are a truly global phenomenon. And, and so I think that, that love them or hate them, they are a form of open education that traditional higher education, some very traditional higher education, have adopted at quite significant scale right across the world. And if we look at the scale at the present time, and I began in the MOOC world right back at the beginning in, in 2012, and I had slides at that time that said, this may be a bubble that will burst in a year or two and be gone. It has a, attracted an enormous number of universities to generate an enormous number of courses which are freely available online for study right across the world. A range of different providers, so the original argument that actually it was relatively closed because it was dominated by North America, and that was a very common argument in the early days, has also disappeared that platforms have emerged worldwide to present um, open educational courses, and within Europe, there's a wide scatter of universities, increasing number of universities, which are also adopting this form of, of, of open education. We see an openness, too, in the sense that there is actually real, and has been from the very beginning, a significant amount of global enrollment. Okay, so different platforms tend to have most of their learners coming from the region they're in. And this is as true of the Chinese platforms and as true of the Middle Eastern platforms as it is of the, of the European and the American platforms. But nevertheless, they gather audiences from right across the world. There has never been a point at which international education, people coming together, voluntarily coming together to learn things from right across the world has ever happened 
at that kind of scale. And it's quite a significant phenomenon because that is an international education that prior to that didn't really exist. You had to get on a plane and go and study in another country for a period of time. This ability was never open to you. And I think that the emergence of platforms in different countries, and now on the pecking order, one of the Chinese platforms is about number four or number three in terms of numbers. Th those are enormous numbers of, of people taking part in and international education. And the other is that it shows a huge appetite worldwide to learn stuff. And you might have you know, arguments against, say, well, most people sign up and they never really manage to learn anything at all. The fact that they've actually signed up and haven't actually gone to the betting shop or gone to the bar, the fact that they've signed up for an, a, a clearly and obviously educational program, I think is also significant and actually a very positive thing. And we should, we should think about the positive and how to capitalize on it rather than on, than, than on the, the numerous failings that do exist. And there's a consequence of those early courses is that inevitably there was then a beginning and a rethinking about what could you do with these courses, a rethinking in traditional universities that actually rarely thought about learning and teaching, to be honest, in, at least in this, this sort of way. A rethinking about how might you use these things in a more substantive way. And of course, many of us who got in at the early stages were quite sensitive to the criticisms about the fact that, well, you weren't giving any credit to them and lots of people dropped out and, you know, you're not reaching the underprivileged and blah, blah, blah. We were sensitive to those criticisms because it went against, in a sense, our, our view of ourselves and our mission. And so we decided to look right from the beginning about how to do it. One of the areas which is growing quite significantly is an exploration about how to give real university credit, ECTS credit, in, 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 w within Europe to MOOCs. I'm going to talk in one of the other talks um, later about some of the problems that exist around assessment in general, not just for MOOCs, but assessment in general remotely. But there are a willingness and an interest to try to find ways to give credit, either because you then join a university degree or else because you come to a test centre and you get tested um, to deal with the rigor question. There's a lot of exploration coming up around that. However, one of the problems, I think, that actually comes out of this willingness on our parts to think about how might we make learning on, 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 on MOOCs more valuable is that we may find that it closes one of the degrees of openness about them. And as a consequence of the search for the money, the business model, and particularly a business model that's associated with credit, we may find that there is a trend towards less openness in terms of availability for free study. And I think that that's something that all of us who work in the MOOC area need to be really quite careful about to ensure that, that you, are, you can study for free as you wish is an absolutely uh, red line that, that we do not allow to be crossed with the platforms that we are part of. MOOCs have had a, a real sort of focus right from the early days on skills and career development. And actually, again, we were talking uh, earlier, some of us, about, about, about universities and skill development. There's almost a schizophrenia here that within universities, the bulk of the tradition that's often, uh, the education that's often offered, is actually offered because the university wants it. And it isn't necessarily a very demand-led kind of process. Whereas universities that have actually gone into the MOOC world have actually tended to look for where the demand was. And cynically, might, one might say, because, it's, because they wanted really big numbers that they could brag about. Nevertheless, they've tended to put their courses into areas where they felt that there was a strong demand. And we know, and we know from the Director General's comments this morning, is that skills and the e-skills agenda is, is up there um, for every country and for every region in the world. And when you look at the range of courses now on offer, and the subject areas that are offered in MOOCs worldwide, we can see one really positive thing, and that's that career-relevant career relevant subjects are undoubtedly the dominant one. The competition between those of us who create MOOCs is to get the best MOOCs in those areas which are about 
careers and skills. The downside of that, and it goes back perhaps to what Minister uh, Bartolo said this morning about there's values and ethics and all of that, is that the humanities and the, um, and the sort of the liberal arts subjects are actually a decreasing percentage of what is on offer. So a concern for some of us, particularly those of us in traditional universities who sort of pride ourselves on, on the importance of, 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 of the humanities and as, as, as one of our, our areas of, of strength and, and interest, is that we need to make sure that we do not entirely slip into that um, knee-jerk um, going for the career subject and that we do actually have um, materials which are available which cover the whole person. Um, is, I suppose, perhaps the way to say it. But the range of skills courses is really, truly enormous. The number of things that you can do, that they go from relatively elementary to sophisticated, is really actually quite staggering at this point in time. And I sat down and I thought, well, I'll screen dump out. Uh, I knew Catherine was here, so I went to Fun and chose some French ones, so I wasn't just using my own universities. But you go across and the range of them is enormous. And you also find, and this is interesting down there in the bottom right-hand corner, you, in, you increasingly find a thinking on the part of large corporations and on the part of governments as to how they might use these resources as a way of raising the skills. And so I think that, that one of the areas that we are likely to see increasing focus is how to ensure that, that the MOOCs that exist now and the new MOOCs that come through, how they actually address that a skills agenda. But at the same time, we need to think quite carefully about how they address the wider person. Actually, interestingly, as a quick aside, one of the first MOOCs we ever produced was on what's called critical thinking. And we still use it. And it was the MOOC which was most asked for by other people and said, can we use your MOOC? It was interesting that critical thinking was the one that they picked on and not the other, um, the other, the other subjects. So it is possible to operate in these areas even with MOOCs. One of the arguments against MOOCs, of course, was that they didn't really reach the people who were the hard ones to reach, that they went for the soft targets and you attracted those who were already educated, and so as a consequence you weren't really getting um, to, to where the problem was. I mean, my argument in a world where reskilling and rethinking is important is that reskilling and rethinking is just as important for graduates as it is for those who have not gained primary skills. They, they have their own needs. But actually that in, we have to think within a world of open courses and of courses where people can just come and take and study as they wish. How easy would it be for people who were rather um, Un, uneducated or unconfident to take some, those sorts of courses on their own. If you collected together a collection of people who had no skills in learning to learn and you put them all together in a, in a large online course, how successful would that course be? And my feeling is that the large number of people who have learned to learn also support those people who come along and try it, but actually have not yet acquired the confidence and the skills to study in this domain. And we do have significant evidence that new beginners, people who've not studied in these settings before, find learning by watching other people and learning how to do it is how they begin, like an apprentice model, is how they begin to acquire those skills. So the relatively small number of disadvantaged people who are in these settings may actually need that larger number of more experienced and skilled learners because they are the ones that help them. Indeed, there is significant peer assistance of, um, of learners within the MOOC settings, much more than you would expect in a well-designed MOOC. The second is that those who are determined to learn do succeed. And all the data are that learners who come from poorer countries, from underdeveloped countries, those who come with a real burning need to learn have a much significantly higher success rate within the MOOC setting than those who actually just drop in to browse. So, so it, it's, it's a wee bit mixed on that. 
We decided that locally we would mimic what was already being done in Boston, and so they called it Boston X and we called it Edinburgh X. We decided that we would capitalise on the fact that our students are valued for volunteering. It becomes part of their student record and, and their record of achievement when they leave the university. We have a lot of volunteering by students. And so we decided the way to reach out, serve our local communities with these global international online courses was to take the students that we have and the knowledge and the skills that they have and take our MOOCs to our local community using students. I think every university could probably mimic that model. And so you are able then to get to grips, if you like, to, with those people who've actually got a real need for education um, by using the power of your own students and the enthusiasm of your own students to help. And some of the MOOCs that we first produced and the ones that have been interesting and um, down there in the bottom, Code Yourself, and that's a Spanish version because it was produced with a South American university in, in Uruguay at the same time. That one, which was Coding for Kids, has been particularly successful with the students taking them out um, into the community. The other, oops, got it. The other things that happened simultaneously to me, and they, they just made me think about the fact that actually we, ha we had a wider range of options as to how we might use the effort that we put into designing these MOOCs, was that, was that two groups of people approached us at the same time. One of them was the, Scot the people who run the digital environment for Scottish schools. And the other one was the University of the Third Age, which began in France but now has bases all around the world. So I've called, them, I've called these things silver MOOCs. You know, it's, I'm, old, I'm an old guy, so I can be rude about all you know, I can do this stuff. So almost simultaneously, they came to us and they said, MOOC, these MOOCs are great, but they don't fit with our timescale and they don't fit with our... With our um, with, with, with how we need to teach. So could you offline them for us and convert them into essentially what is open courseware and make them available to us so that we could use them? And actually that led us to thinking that perhaps A, we should be making more of our materials OER and open, um, but secondly, actually, that, more, that it would be open courseware-like so that they could be taken to use by those people where it's not possible or not reasonable for them to be able to go online and study on the courses. And so, therefore, you can find a further use for your materials beyond that of the closed MOOC platforms by making them available and supporting people who can teach with them in a more conventional face-to-face -face setting. And particularly for schools where the school kids can't sign up to, uh, the, the teachers can't have kids signing up to, to um, uh, their identities away to platforms. That seemed to us a very sensible solution. Interestingly, actually, the first two MOOCs that they asked us to do were critical thinking and philosophy, which goes against what I said about, um, about those career-related subjects. Okay, so, there are lots of things that go on, and there are lots of universities that are exploring all of these options. And so I want to come back to the question of, of how would you drive that forward? I mean, how would you make that work? How would you scale it more? How would you achieve more impact? Because, because I think that unless one has a purposeful way of driving it forward and promoting more openness, then um, they, this, what you get is quite ad hoc. And I'm going to go back to a study that we did for the, that the European Commission commissioned from us, which was called Changing Pedagogical Landscapes, which we, which we published last year. And I'm going to go back to this cascade, because this, to me, sums up the, the challenge of how you take policy level and then deal with it down on the ground in terms of what universities do. It's a long, long way from the high-level policy statement to the learner, in the, and I'm going to say in the classroom, even though that actually is a weirdly old-fashioned thing to say, but the learner in the classroom. And actually, also, I, sh I realized afterwards, we should have done it the other way around. We should have put the policy people at the bottom and the learner at the top, because they're the most important. But it's a long way down. And so you need, down at university level, you need a set of, of drivers and ways of, of making um, policy um, take place. So two of our recommendations, one of them was that if we want open education to take root in higher education, 
there needs to be that top-level agreement between governments and the universities that open education is actually what is wanted and what that means, given what I said about variabilities in, in what open means. If you want it, you need an agreement that this is actually what you want and what open education means. So if it's to use open materials, then, then fine. If it's to use open courses, whatever it is, there needs to be an agreement and a roadmap and understanding because without that, there's a vacuum within which universities can't operate. And I would argue at this point in time that that does not really exist at national level broadly across Europe. The second is, and this is taken from European Universities Association's uh, study a short a while ago about autonomy. Universities need enough autonomy to be able to move fast in this kind of world and to develop the open education that's wanted, that's been agreed, the way it works best for them. So not all of them will do it the same way. They need the autonomy to be able to work out how to do it and then to enact it. So the lower the autonomy that universities have, the less you will actually get out. University autonomy varies a lot across universities. And then inside universities, you need leadership and you need strength. And actually, I think there was a leadership um, conference uh, that came in educational leadership conference just built. You need strong leadership and mechanisms in universities to understand how to manage a change of this size. And I think when you look across European universities, you find very large amounts of innovations at low levels that never achieve scale and impact. The number of universities that achieve scale and impact is relatively small. And, and so this was my list of governance requirements that are based on my experience of taking universities into massive open online courses, taking them into distance education, educating governance participants. These are the faculty, these are professors to a large significant extent about how you do this kind of stuff within universities. Understanding and exposing risk and return on investment. What do you get back when you do this stuff? Why, you know, what is the business model? And trust, trust, trust. I'm going to give you two examples of the ways that my own university has, has tackled that. One of them is to make quite explicit to ourselves and to use when we are doing this kind of work, to make it quite explicit to ourselves what our appetite for risk is in particular areas, and you will see on this one that on the, if I can see, oh no, I've got a screen in front of me, that's useful. If you look, therefore, on the fifth one down, education, the student experience, we are, we have decided not to be risk averse in that area, that we are prepared to innovate and to take chances and to gamble with care. We are prepared to experiment in education. We understand that that is actually where we are. And having done that, having understood that and having decided that you will move your university forward into a major development, a major development of open education, you need to understand how you manage major change projects. And so you have to have processes that allow you to guide major change processes within the university. And this includes bringing all the stakeholders on side and all of that stuff that we talk about. And it's really easy to talk about it, but it's a hell of a hard to do it actually on the ground. And so having processes, and these are my processes, the ones that I used um, when I took University of Edinburgh into fully online master's programs and then into full scale MOOCs, these sorts of processes, these tools were invaluable in making sure that you actually stayed on track and work. And it, I talked to a lot of universities about this, and I'm always quite surprised that some of the things they pick up most are these things. It's not the hype stuff about MOOCs and that, because they can read it anyway. It's the practical tools that they did not actually have for how to manage those sorts of changes within their universities. So I think that there is a task there in educational leadership and in governance in process management that we still have to tackle for universities if they're going to successfully move forward. And so it gets me to a point then at which, at which for my own university, I, we can see how open education fits 
with the rest of our traditional model. And for universities, this is the problem. How does it fit and how are you going to use it against this backdrop of the traditional, which you can't drop and you have to keep doing it the same high quality? And the answer is that, that and I put 2025, I think it may take us to 2030, but, but hopefully not long. We've, we've, speed is, is quite important here. The open sits and interconnects the three main areas of our educational business. The on-campus, 40,000 students who are on campus, but will increasingly take fully online courses as part of their degrees. So they will be blended. Some of those online courses will actually be the MOOCs. Some of them will be MOOC-like. Our open studies people, our lifelong learning people, who don't take degrees with us, but take short courses with us, for them, the MOOCs are lifelong learning, but also they're a pathway for all those learners through to our degree programs, and perhaps a pathway for our degree students across to those lifelong learning programs. And then for our fully off-campus off students, which would be about 10,000 by that point in time, um, open education will be a route into those degrees, but also some of it will be a route for them to study materials and things which are not in the courses which they're already taking. So we can see that open education allows us channels into and across from. It allows, gives us a range of courses which offer different features to all of those other courses which are synchronized, scheduled, on campus, all the traditional stuff. They give us a degree of freedom for entry, for exit, for different kinds of study that sits alongside and complements. And when I talk this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about, about that process of how, of how all of those connect together. Just finishing. So, last slide. Just on time for the tinkling bell. So, for, for us as traditional higher education institutions, I think that the massive open online courses allow us a way, open education of this form, allows us a way to tick some of those boxes that it's very hard for us to tick as part of with our traditional campus-based education at this point in time. 20 years from now, it may be very, very different, probably will, but right now, it's possible for us to address some of these questions through these kinds of courses and let them interdigitate and, and fit alongside and interdigitate with the traditional residential education, which will change relatively slowly over time. And, and I think that that, as we move forward, in a sense is our beginnings of a 21st century higher education system that takes the best of what we can do in the open world, the best of what we can do in the traditional world, and try to get the best out of what we can do with the interface between them. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.